tonight I get to introduce two of my favorite people. Well, actually, I'm only introducing one of them, but two of my favorite people in the whole world and two of my favorite artists. So let's start with, from Cal State Northridge, Samantha Fields. Butterfingers. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I don't know why I brought this, but, I, you know, sketchbooks, we should have them all the time. Um, so I have known Marcia Steinberg for three and a half days. Three and a half days. But we all know that by summer arts reckoning, that means I've known her for three and a half weeks. Right? Yeah, so we're old friends, Marcia. And um, I've learned a few things about Marcia, aside from the obvious things that she's an internationally renowned artist who showed her work all over the world. Her pedigree is long and mostly in Italian. Um, one of her students describes her as someone who went to study abroad and never came home. Um, if you don't know Marcia, she works with the CSU in our international program in Florence, and we actually have a coterie of Italian students here with us, Italian students in the house. I hope you've had a chance to meet them and talk to them. And if you want to know more about our Florence program, Marcia is the person to talk to. Um, so some of the things I've learned about Marcia in our three and a half weeks of friendship. First, she calls her dorm room her house, which confused me at first because she would say she was going to her house and I imagine she was going to some charming bungalow <laughs> on campus somewhere that I've never seen before. And then I realized she lives right next door to me in the dorm. So I wish I could think of my dorm as a house. So should we all think like Marcia? Um, but the most important thing I've learned about Marcia is that she's more than a professor. She's a mentor. And how do I know this after three and a half days, AKA three and a half weeks? It's because I'm working with her students and former students, of which there are many here at Summer Arts. People hear that Marcia's coming and they scream, Marcia's coming! Oh my God, they see her, their eyes light up, they go running across the room for the biggest hug ever. It's incredible to see. Her students say about her that one of the things she does is she cares about them as people, as human beings. She learns about them. She learns what motivates them. She's brutally honest, but in the most constructive possible way. And there's a quote that describes Marcia from Henry Ford, Katie, I looked it up, um, that obstacles are those frightful things that get in your way when you take your eye off the goal. That very accurately describes Marcia. She really has an idea of what she wants to do. She has an idea for her students and she makes it happen. So I am so happy that Marcia is here and I'm so happy to have become friends with her and met all of you. So please join me in welcoming Marcia Steinberg to the stage. Marsha's life. I'm Marsha. I'm going to talk about my life. I'm going to talk about things that I've done. I'm going to talk about my paintings. You're going to see a lot of them. And I'm going to, as you know, and you know already that I'm the coordinator of the studio art department for California State University in Florence. And we very fortunately have a wonderful agreement with the Academia di Belle Arte di Firenze, and that is why we have seven wonderful, but wonderful, <laughs> Italian students with us here. I also teach in another school called Lorenzo de Medici, which is an Italian school. Lots of Americans go there also. Tonight I will present about, not about, five different series of paintings. My first abstract paintings, my bowls, or otherwise called Tori, another series called Creazione da Nulla, in English it's Creation from Nothing, and another series called Iniquitous Masters, or in Italian, Cattivi Maestri. And then I'm going to talk about paintings that were inspired 
by a movie called The Traveling Players by Angelopoulos, a Greek director. And the, I have a few sub-series in there, and one of them is called Mysterious Women. The next one is called Eternally Ascending Canon. And the last one is called Non-Ecludean Geometries. I'm going to talk about my thoughts regarding my artistic investigation, and I'm also going to include thoughts by a, two very important people in my life. One is called Paneotis Kansas, Greek, who's a psychoanalyst, and another person called Rolando Bellini, and some of you know him already, an art critic, who discussed with me a lot, and I mean a lot, about what is art, what is painting. To begin my life, I began my artistic studies at Santa Monica College, then it was called Santa Monica City College, and then I went to CSU Northridge. Yay, CSU Northridge. <laughs> I took the opportunity to study abroad in my third year as a junior at, from CSU, from CSUN, I'm sorry, I didn't call it CSUN for a long time, okay. And this allowed me to meet the Academia di Belle Arte di Firenze because on my third year, on my year abroad with Cal State, I went to the Academia di Belle Arte di Firenze. I also graduated from the Academia di Belle Arte di Firenze. And I also went to another school called Il Bisonte, which is a graphic art school, an etching school. It's a very important school, and I went there also, an engraving and etching school. The meeting with Florence was fatal, as you can tell, because I've been there for so many years. I rediscovered almost immediately, and at the same time, the cultural legacy of, of the Renaissance that one breathes in the city, and it's really true, you really do breathe it in the city, in the city of art and a bit all over Tuscany. And at the same time, I discovered the wild Maremma, which is in the south part of, it, of uh, Tuscany. I dedicated myself with passion to the, the discovery of this new world more and more until it became my second home. And it is my second home. My first one is the apartment over there. <laughs> I came from the generation of the post-World War. World War II, that is. I was a baby boomer. When I was in college, there was the Vietnam War. And we were also the flower children in the 60s. We were hippies. We were rebels. And with this generation of Vietnam, and with this re rebellion, I could not help by find my, but find myself and be attracted to the new artistic trends, painters who deconstructed and dissolved forms. They opened up the spaces, and they refused to carry out the regulatory function of the name of the father. And I'm going to explain this later on a little bit right now. The name of the father means a function that regulates, the function that stabilizes laws and desires. I'm talking about painters like de Kooning, Gorky, Rothko, Pollock, among others. The, ab the famous abstract expressionistic painters. Following this line of thought, art invented the free gesture, various events, performances, new dada, new realism, etc. Okay, I'm going to show you now some of my abstract paintings that I have been doing, that I did for years. Aren't they great, big like that? Oh my God. Is that... They're all big paintings anyway, but I mean, they're huge up there. Okay. Sometimes I have the titles in Italian. These are all oil paintings, by the way. This is a painting on wood. All the rest are on canvas. And I give titles that are dealing with nature very often. This 
This was the painting used on the invitation for the evening tonight. Pietre means rocks. I like rocks. <laughs> Here's another rock. <laughs> Cracks. This is a three-plate color etching. La Calvana, which the Italians know what it is, is a mountain range just outside of Florence near Prato. Terra means earth. Grotta means grotto. I think I'm saying it correctly in English. These are all black and white, that's obvious. Here's more rocks. Again. This is another four plate etching. Okay. I'm going to talk about something else a little bit. Okay. In the art world, there, there was nothing to guide artists then, and there is nothing that guides artists now. From the 50s to the 70s, abstract expressionism was very anti-establishment. In those days, the chaos suited me perfectly. It was great. The cry of Nietzsche, I think you say Nietzsche or Nietzsche in, Eng in English, is what I felt, and the cry of Nietzsche is the following. One must have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. It was pure form and color. Making art and understanding what art is in a foreign country can only expand and nourish one's personal artistic vocabulary. Florence offers an immense amount of cultural and artistic inspiration that add new insights to one's thinking and artistic language. The anthropology of looking at and being in front of a beautiful work of art leads to fainting. The Stendhal syndrome, because Stendhal fainted in front of Santa Croce. This is a photograph of Santa Croce. It's one of the most beautiful churches in Florence. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a few other images that are inside the church of Santa Croce. This is a fantastic cru crucifix by Cimabue, who was Giotto's teacher. This is from uh, the 1250s. This is a fresco by Giotto of San Francesco, because Santa Croce Church is the, I forgot how you say this, but anyway, it's San, Fran it's San Francesco. <clears throat> And Freud faints in front of the Acropolis. Coming to Florence, the beautiful trauma can be a unique opportunity to reflect on language of colors that become stories. And at the same time, a meeting that I experienced as a young student from Los Angeles. I'm from Los Angeles, by the way. I, that. <laughs> I started having an enormous interest in these animals, and I'm going to show you. Okay. After graduating from the Florence Art Academy, which is the Academia di Belle Arti di Firenze, I began to paint, etch, and draw bulls. And here is one of the magnificent bulls in the area of Maremma. Here's another one. Here is a landscape of Maremma. And then this other landscape that I'm going to show you, the area that is to, to the right of the river, the Ombrone, is where I used to go all the time. Not in the middle of those trees, but in, somewhere in that area, over to the right. Marema is a land that is located, as I said, in the south of Tuscany, where these animals, magnificent animals, live and graze. They're very strong bulls with very long horns sometimes. Greek mythology, the Minotaur, the bullfights, and the Mediterranean light. This Mediterranean light that defines objects unambiguously are united, linked inside of my head, and transferred onto the canvas. In my mind, there is still de Kooning and Gorky, still there, 
and the result is a creation of forms that are deconstructed. <clears throat> It is a deconstruction, I mean a deconstruction of forms. <laughs> the bulls became massive mountains that occupy the whole picture and come right out of the borders, off the edges of the canvas like an abstract expressionistic painting. I worked from my drawings, I worked on site. I didn't paint them on site because that's a little difficult but I also took hundreds of photographs. I did parts of a bull. I deconstructed these parts. <laughs> I did etchings also of bulls. My master's in art is in etching also, by the way. And this is a monotype and an etching together. Okay, I'm going to change themes now. I'm going to talk about la creazione da nulla. Plastically Florence, the heart of humanism, presents for me anagenesis, which is a research, a rising again, a rebirth. The Renaissance is possible because it really happened, historically. I went around looking at frescoes on the walls that tell stories, the shapes and the colors that tell the same stories that become another story. Stories represented ten, a hundred times, the same stories, but always new stories. For example, Andrea del Sarto, Jacopo Carucci, who is Pontormo, among many others. I see their hands moved, forced by the rule, the regulation, because they, they were told what to do. But at the same time, free to act in the creation of forms, that make up their style, because Pontormo's style is different from Giotto's style. So with this action, they inserted inside the rule what Vasari called a license, without offending the rule. For example, in this deposition by Pontormo, you see the pink shirt on the man that's holding Christ? That was not a great thing to do, let me tell you. But that was accepted because he didn't go outside of the rule too much, even though it's skin that's pink or it's a shirt that's pink. We don't know. And we, also, we do know, though, that weather deteriorates paper, wooden supports, frescoes, colors, and little by little, everything starts to disappear. <clears throat> everything, or the figurative art, begin to disappear, they vanish away, and they bring out what's called the white of the unknown. See this area down at the bottom of Paolo Cello's fresco? In that white, I see the anguish of the artist in front of nothing, like when you begin a painting, in front of a white wall or a white canvas, before the hand starts moving to create stories. I go around to churches and monasteries. De Kooning and the masters are still with me. They never leave me. Thus, fragments of frescoes by Pontormo, Cimabue, Piera della Francesca undergo an expansion. They fill up the entire canvas, and thus they are transformed into an abstract painting. I wanted to combine the Renaissance with modernity. The results are these paintings that I'm going to show you. This was taken from a Chimabue painting. It's 
Sometimes I paint it a little bit in the empty space, as you can see in this one, number 31. This is from Ponto Ordemont. also from, from Pontormo, and so is this one from Pontormo. Now I'm going to talk about Cattivi Maestri, and I hope that everybody will try to understand why I'm calling them iniquitous or bad masters, because I love them, they're not bad masters. But I'm going to talk a little, you'll hear, you'll hear what I'm about. Iniquitous masters or cattivi maestri. There comes a time in life when the fundamental question comes out, to be or not to be. For me to be or not to be established and revealed itself in breast cancer. To be or not to be, Kansas, my analyst, tells me that the answer is to be. It opens for me an intense and troubled past. The verb to be, from its existential implications, extends and embraces a universe totally unknown to me. Bertram Russell, when he was in prison for his pacifism, had said that a large part of human, humanity's troubles stems from the ambiguity of the verb to be. What corresponds to the verb to be in painting? What does it mean for an artist who deals with expression to ask the question to be or not to be. A glass of Chianti, which is a fabulous Tuscan wine, <laughs> a panino, which is a sandwich with salami, and long discussions between Kansas, Bellini, and Marcia. A psychoanalyst, an art critic, and a painter who discussed the verb to be. In these discussions, the object appears as nothing when lit by something, or actually when lit by, by another nothing, become something. One must be able to say something about each individual, whether abstract or concrete. One has to be able to assign a predicate to everything, and this is done by using the verb to be. So you can say, two is a number, Socrates is a philosopher, this is a butterfly. I look at the pictures of my masters, and here's one of my masters, Rothko. I follow their brushstrokes, the colors, the forms, searching for an object, a butterfly, a glass, a story, but nothing can be found. In the discussion between Socrates and Gorgia, where the arts are divided into three categories, painting is classified among the silent arts. Between a glass of Chianti and a sandwich with salami, we travel into ancient times when artistic creation was linked to ethics. Art is like a political matter. It recalls Heraclito, or otherwise Heraclitus, who defines the eyes and the ears as bad witnesses. One speaks of Plato's myth, the allegory of the cave, our eyes and our ears are made so as not to hear and not to see. We are like prisoners who see only the shadows of objects and not the real objects that remain out of our reach. At this point, we ask ourselves about the artist's political role. What is the artist? And my interlocutors, Kansas and Bellini say that the artist is a subject that finds himself or herself not on top of an ivory tower, but on top of a control tower, and from that position is able to see something more than other subjects can see. The artist is the one who can see and show something about the invisible object more than others. His or her vision is a kind of gift that is offered 
to his or her community. According to Kansas and Bellini, artists like politicians, clergymen, poets, masters, perform the function of the name of the Father. The eye, our eyes, see photons, which are very small elementary light particles. The object is, is in, instead, the object, the famous object, is constructed in the brain. I begin to ask myself if it, if it is permissible to ignore how the brain works and good common sense. Is it okay to break up objects trying to seek its essence in the particle, particles that make up the objects? I think to show the particles of the objects is the worst form of nihilism. Deep down there is nothing. This is part of a confession by Rothko saying, I paint nothing. The ancients had the need to say only what one's ears could hear. For me, this appeared not to be a defect anymore, but instead an excess of intelligence. Aeschylus, Eschilo in Italian, designated as profane. Socrates sentenced to death. Pontormo censored for the choir of San Lorenzo. And I also included in this list my masters, de Kooning, Rothko, and Gorky. I am an American even more a Californian, and I'm am I expressing nostalgia for the Eleactic Circles? Okay, the Eleactic Circles are the pre-Socratic -Soc <laughs> school of philosophers founded by Parmenide way back when. The, the era of transparency, which is what we're, we're in this era, demands that the truth be made public immediately, even when one tries and expresses unsaid, not speakable truths, and to show to man what is not supposed to be showed to man. My pictorial cycle creates a relationship between the speakable and ethics. It is said that Zeus covered Sonic, who was a female divinity linked to the underground, with a sumptuous cloak to cover her nakedness. That which our eyes see is not the nakedness, which is horrifying. Our eyes do not see it. They just don't see it. But the wove, we only see the woven and embroidered cloak over her. Looking below is like destroying the work of a god. To deconstruct is sacrilegious, to go against God. Is it right to ignore the workings of the brain trying to show what lies beneath? Deep down, way deep down, there are quarks. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. A quark is an elementary particle and a fundamental part of matter. These quarks are encaged in electrons at an inaccessible energy level. In the sub below is the nothing of an electron. Released from the source, it is in a kind of limbo where its presence is represented by a host of ghosts that they just run around all over the place, exploring their journey t towards a concrete situation or the screen. Some people define this as nuclear aristocracy. I call it by its name, nihilism. Paintings that are supposed to be abstract and a girl walking in front, across, in front of these paintings who seems to ignore the paintings, or rather be outraged by what they show. Colors, shapes and colors, nothing or something, leaving the viewer with the task of fishing from left to right so as to get a glimpse of an object that he or he sees. You know, we always say, oh, I see this, I see that. Okay. Masters, certainly they are masters. De Kooning, Rothko, Gorky, definitely are masters. The artists that my girls walk in front of are undoubtedly great masters. Because it is said that they are great masters. They become expressions and representations of just that. A knowledge that everyone uses without knowing it. As babies, we see the world made of forms and colors. 
de Kooning and Picasso make us remember what we knew and what we were not supposed to remember. They show through their works the process of vision before it arrives to its maturity. We all have traces deep down in our memory. This is what de Kooning, Rothko, and Gorky are showing us. When we were children and our brain had not yet reached its maturity, we saw the world like this, and one calls it cork morsile. And it is the same way in which the world is seen in psychosis. It seems that in some forms of psychosis, the body is seen just like Picasso represents it. The eye, the nose, the mouth are not in the usual place that they're supposed to be. They are misplaced and this produces anxiety. How is it that for me, those who were masters have become iniquitous masters? A first answer can be found in my own biography. My stay in Florence becomes a stumbling block, a glitch, an accident that calls into question my previous memory of the past. My convictions, rooted in Jewish culture and my Californian education. The palaces, the towers, the domes, the bell towers, Masaccio, Donatello, Leonardo, Botticelli, Pontormo, Lorenzo, and the academics of Careggi, a collective explanation of disturbing erotics that upset my certainties. They are the cause of my artistic turning point. It's not impossible for me to represent God. Due to my Jewish roots, I, I'm not supposed to, but I can still try to represent him. The beautiful is produced in this way. Looking towards the sky, looking for the one who is in heaven, who has a name, it is called Father, Father God. In an evident way, Florence, the heart of humanism, introduces me to this resurgence, anagenesis, the Renaissance. I also would like to tell you that I studied very, very seriously all of their techniques. For example, this was rubbed, the paint was rubbed onto the canvas. It was not gessoed, it just had fish glue on it. And this painting is entirely glazed. Sometimes I have my girl just as an outline. Sometimes I have my girl more to the right. Sometimes I have her more to the left. This is a very early Roscoe. I always change the color of her dress. And see the red on the bottom? That's the floor. Damiano. That's the floor. The brown strip is the, what we call batiscopa, and I don't know how to call it. It's the part that starts the wall. The white is the wall, and then it's the de Kooning painting. I'm sure all of you know these paintings. It's their paintings. I mean, I just repainted them. Interpreted them also. Sometimes her dress is transparent. Gorky and his mom. These are all very large paintings, by the way. And sometimes she's walking out of the painting. See her over there on the right? And now she's on the left. And now she's on the right. And now she's just a sliver. This is a three color plate etching. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the traveling players. 
In Italian, it's called La Rescita. It's a wonderful film. I highly suggest that you watch it. Okay, I'm going to talk about my paintings. And the first series is called Donna, Miss Donne, excuse me, Misteriose, or Mysterious Women. And as I already mentioned, they are divided uh, into different thematic clusters, but in truth, all of them link to a movie, a great movie, by Theo Angelopoulos. The Traveling Players, or the Recita in Italian. It's a very, very strong story, a unique somatic storytelling, and it's very epic. And it's about a traveling group of actors that travel around Greece during the time that it, uh, when Greece was occupied by the fascists, by the Nazis. And for me, this movie produced, it induced me to feel an autobiographical, uh, autobiographical, it's coming out in Italian, autobiographical flashback. <laughs> I apologize for this. Au, uh, <laughs> reference autobiographical. So let's put it in another way. Yeah, it's a good idea. The story can be understood as past knowledge, but not through what has already occurred, but as a statement that becomes representation. A representation of a representation that does not express just a representation, but rather its reconstruction. In this case, I refer to a reconstruction in my own works, a certain number of paintings that are that are preceded by a painting or archetype that dates back to 208, and this is this painting. When I lived in, on a street called Via Pietra Piana, I can assume that this finished work is dated December 2008. Immediately after this, I moved to Via Cavour, which is near Piazza San Marco. The thematic series about which I will speak begins in this new Florentine residence that takes me away from the Sant'Ambrogio market, only to bring me near the Central Market. In January 2009, I begin, therefore, this articulated but unified pictorial research. I begin, no, I'd like to correct myself. I wish I could return to the immediate intu intuition or to the initial inventiveness that sparked the entire series of works that I am presenting here today. It may also be defined as a premonition. It was an abstract view of a chromatic environment and situation that, in short, I would have expanded and explored in many, many ways, referring to this movie, the movie of Angelopoulos. <clears throat> I would like to say something also, that when I saw this movie, the um, stills I'm going to talk about a little bit more seemed like paintings already to me. When I saw The Traveling Players, I felt a strong emotion, not only for this magical and moving film that is also a symbolic metaphor of some recent history of Greece, but it was really beautiful, and it was also very close to what have I had been painting. Perhaps I was feeling nostalgic of my American past, having been dominated by the abstraction of subject matters from the lessons of an illustrious pair, Gorky and de Kooning, that I've mentioned before. And soon afterwards, a third element would join these two painters, Rothko, and these three are all my masters. These three masters, heroes, are the foundation of my series of works that I call, and I spoke about it already, in Iniquitous Masters. Let's go back to the movie, though. In it, I immediately recognized the succession of images that were intended already to be paintings. A sequence of freeze frames that presented themselves as if they were paintings. My paintings in which figuration and abstraction coexisted and mingled, created before my eyes a unique pictorial context. Fascinated by this possibility, I obtained a copy of the film, and I began to study it very attentively. The more I watched this film and its fluid visual storytelling, the more I started seeing a sequence of individual images which could become a pictorial language for me, comparable to the pictorial contexts. 
So I began to translate these filmographic fragments, these individual images extrapolated from the film into paintings. I started with some interiors where, at least in the beginning, I transfigured the presence of the protagonists of the film into symbolic shadows, as you can see right here. These protagonists were members of a traveling theatrical company, as I said. They were poor, but very happy, always on the go, and therefore uprooted from everywhere, and yet very attached to their beloved Greece. In the film, the journey never ends. Never ends as in The Traveling Players, which is the film. Okay. Each theatrical representation is always terminated by accidental events that interrupt the representation that they are doing. This cut in the film is also found in another film by the same director entitled Los Guardos de Ulisse, or Ulisse's Gaze, and it is also present in my painting. Representation in painting of cognitive processes. I'd like to explain this a little bit. It's like a period at the end of a sentence. And then there is a new sentence. That's the cut. One sees one scene, then he or she sees another scene. Each painting is slightly different than the one before or after it. The story stops but still continues and we go on to the next painting or scene. The title, <clears throat> as we were looking at the series of the mysterious women, that I, I created these paintings that are kind of like dreamlike places, suspended between reality and fantasy, which paintings were resolved very quickly. I discussed all this naturally, first of all, with the psychoanalyst Paneotis Kansas. And Paneotis liked this relationship with the film, perhaps because he was drawn to his own nostalgia for the motherland, which is precisely Greece. So that urged me to keep on going. We discussed all together over and over again, raising questions about and analyzing in detail what could have inspired me. We scrutinized the many possibilities of why I was pushed to do this unconsciously and consciously. Afterwards, we talked about the film and about the director and, of course, about my paintings. Paintings transfigured into scenarios without figures. This is a series dealing with non-Euclidean geometry. In a certain way, they're like windows that overlook pictorial places, which I called geometria non ecluidea, or non ecludian geometry. Windows uh, on the painting, made of paint in a painting. So you get the feeling that you're looking through a window all the time. This reversal deserved to be further analyzed in depth. Each translation of the film into painting deserved a lot and a lot and a lot of analysis. And also because, simultaneously, this brought me to represent another issue, a series of figures suspended in the painting. Painted figures immersed this series called Eternally Ascending Canon. <clears throat> 
a series of figures suspended in the painting, painting, painted figures immersed in pictorial context without figuration. Instead, they were figures consisting of a chromatic relationship inside the paintings. I'm talking about the series, this uh, new series that I called Canone Eternamente Ascendente. Elaborate chromatic relationships of colors, even when I was dealing with quivering white surfaces, similar to frozen impasto mixtures of snow. A surface dense with gradational tones and shades, with colored reflections that emerge from the blanket of snow, just as it happened with certain significant painters of the past, historical painters. I don't, do not want to talk about these painters from the past right now, because I've already talked about them a lot, and at length with an art historian that I've mentioned before, Rolando Bellini. And the latter wrote his critical interpretations about these historical paintings many, many different times, insisting on this transfer from cinema to the figurative arts, as he himself called it. In discussing this transfer, Bellini revisited a noted verbal expression of his precise artistic enhancement of cinema ascribed to his master, Carlo Ludovico Raggianti, who was an art historian. Thus, a reversal of history from cinema to painting, because usually it's painting to cinema, and here it's cinema to painting. A paradoxical reversal, as Bellini calls it, which is full of meaning, of fantastic provocations, of visionary vitality. A <clears throat> and these are Bellini's words, a reversal which, in short, gave to my pictorial research an unusual and rather unique flavor. So I kept on going and went ahead. Now I painted simultaneously my windows and my black figures that I call Womini on white grounds. In one of my pictorial transformations of an image stolen from the movie, there is a feeling of witnessing an endless climbing upwards and therefore going beyond the upper edge of the painting itself. Black figures going towards a platonic, super celestial place, or towards the universe. I'm talking about the paintings that we're looking at. In the film, you have a shot from above that shows some of the members of the theater company, some theater people, hungry, trudging in the snow, they are going towards a chicken. They're running towards a chicken because they're hungry. In my painting, I didn't put the chicken, okay. In my paintings instead, these people seem to be going towards the sky, towards infinity, up to the sky to meet God. In another context, the inspiring subject matter was a tree. And the tree, in fact, remained roughly that of the film but it was transfigured into a totemic tree, much less dramatic. The film was set in 1942 during the war, with Greece occupied by the fascists, as I mentioned. From the branches of the great tree were hanged people that I transformed in my painting into flashes of light and color. A quivering, moving presence that recalls, in and of itself, other solitary trees, as the, art critic, as the art critic confirmed. And these are the trees of Pete Mondrian. Like some very famous ones, these are very famous, as everybody knows, <clears throat> a legendary series of solitary trees that undergo a metamorphosis from a tree to a ludo-geometric tree. Trees which, in fact, I've always loved. Some translations from film to paintings become more and more daring and become distancing, and they began to distance themselves from the film. As I proceeded in this transfer from a visual script to a painting, I appropriated more of the same visions that, in this process, became more and more mine, Marcia's. Less approachable to the context of the film, and more and more mine. In this way, I began to give space to my dreamlike dimensions. 
and to my secret hidden memory, to my inner world. The psychoanalyst would have a lot to say about this, don't you think so? It was not a dismissal, but rather the opposite. This migration, as the art critic defined it, was an opening, a breakthrough, which brought out, overflowed instead, everything that I had collected and that was hidden inside of me. A part of me that was never revealed before came out and was discovered only to become paintings. Calling it in its own way cinemata, cinematografico, uh, consequentiality, so it's the, as a film goes. The, 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 yeah, as a film goes. Okay. The possible synesthesia, which is a sense experience, the sensations of colors, the intertextuality, whether explicit or cryptic, or immediate or indirect, could be subject to a textual analysis of my paintings. A thematic series after a thematic series. I could also give some examples, or I could invite the critics who do this for their work to do it for me. The trauma, the emergent intertextuality between filmmaking and painting in my paintings end up proposing a perspective study of things in reverse, a reversal of history from cinema to painting, thereby imposing research, as Bellini claimed, of new critical models. And that intertextual reversal in seduced and urged me to move forward, forcing a little the role-playing game, or if we want, the intertextuality from my series of paintings inspired by Mr. Angolopoulos. Furthermore, I attacked a big problem, another big problem. Once again, discussed with my two interlocutors, the art critic and the psychoanalyst. I talk with them all the time. Who insist on saying, and I too want to emphasize, that the condition of the artist today is characterized by an extreme loneliness. The only reference or guide or spokesman that the artist has is the art market. So we spent entire days discussing painting, science, culture, and politics. And my interlocutors, the two people that I mention all the time, therefore have replaced the commissioners of the past. I must add, and both Paniotis and Bellini were in agreement in recognizing this also, that in all of this that I'm talking about, there is a reflection of my teaching in the way that I have always given all of myself, all of my heart, without reservations. But I would like to conclude by adding one last point but certainly not a minor issue, that I think is very present in my pictorial autobiography. I did it, okay. In the end, my paintings that derive from a fascination with film and art history detach themselves more and more, but retain an analogous ambiguity between reality and imagination. It is the same ambiguity comparable to that found in film, suspended between invention and a mirroring of reality between dreams and reality. In my opinion, my paintings end up evidencing a problem, a crucial point for the history of art and for painting. They reveal a historical quarrel that calls into question decades and decades and decades of artistic research and centuries of painting. It is, in short, the false opposition between figurative painting and abstract painting. For in reality, all painting is abstract and at the same time figurative. Thank you. If you have any questions, 
Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> or they'd like to ask him something or say something? Uh, hi. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, I come from something of a scenic painting background, so I've done a lot of like painting on walls and stuff. And uh -huh. I know it's really hard to get like just like a smooth like black color. I can't hear you really. It's a little low. Can you speak a little louder, or maybe the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes, it's much better. Okay, I'm gonna repeat everything I just said. I came from a scenic painting background, so I have a lot of experience with like having to put paint and like color match and things. Uh huh. And so I noticed that a lot of the recreations you did on the I think it was Donna like line of the woman looking at the paintings. I, those were recreations of other paintings. And there was a lot of like raw sort of like brush strokes and things. Was it hard for you? Like if you messed up when trying to recreate someone else's work, did you just have to scrap it and start over? Or no, no, you... no, 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 no. You work, you, if you mess up, you wipe it off really quickly because it's oil paint and you think real fast and you wipe it off. You can do that. And it comes right off. With a little bit of turpentine, it comes right off. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> okay, let me make sure you can. Hi. Hi. So, um, I, I guess I had more of a commentary, but I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed kind of how your work merges figurative and abstraction together because um, um, I... I've been in a, uh, an art program where it seemed as though the programs of figure, there was a figurative track and an abstract track and they seemed to diverge and um, in my work I felt like it would intermix very easily and so I just really appreciated seeing all the different series and how you got to mix those two together and I especially love the, the quote you ended with about how all painting is abstract and mm -hmm. also figurative so that's all. Well thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I know that it's divided. I know that very well, very well. But it can be put together. Hi. Hi. So the work that you showed were all series of work, and I was wondering if you began those those series think, knowing that it would be a series, or did you begin as a single work and then grow from there? It's an excellent question. Okay, I um, would like to say the following. Uh, when you are in a certain way of what you know, how you work, you know what you like, or you're investigating it, and you're trying to figure out what you like, you do one painting, and maybe you do another painting. And if you live in Europe, which I do, in Italy, and you read also and look at all of the books of the abstract painters, or the informal painters, which are the same, the European uh, abstract expressionists, Every single one of them did 25,000 paintings of the same subject matter. And the subject matter was red and green, or blue and yellow. And then if you go back even further in time, the stories that were told, as I mentioned, that became, that were painted all the time, the stories of Christ or the stories of Mary, and they were constantly painted by different painters, even though they were the same stories. And there's always a lot of painting of the same stories. So they all become series all the time. Did, did I make sense in what I'm saying? So you, you learn how to make, you work thinking about series. You don't think about a product, one painting. So it becomes your little movie. And when you work in a series, you put in the third painting what you didn't put in the second painting. And you learn something from the fifth painting and you put it in the tenth painting. And there, because it's always a new painting. Always a new painting. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Ciao, Marcia. Ciao. <laughs> and uh, no, I think that your work is uh, incredible. I am really enjoy 
uh, all your abstract, uh, abstract research and uh, it wake up my emotion because uh, it's really uh, strong, uh, it has really a lot of things in. And uh, I want to ask you if um, the movie, the narration that move, uh, and so a subject that uh, is um, does not stop, but uh, is continuing to um, to get up uh, feelings in you, and etc. etc. Is if uh, it, how it changed changed <laughs> your way to research uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, to research uh, by the extractism, uh, I don't know. I understand what you're saying. It is, <laughs> I understand perfectly what you're saying. Okay. Um, the idea of a series of freeze frames and the yeah. idea, okay, is also the same logic in my iniquitous masters. They are, I've done, I don't know, 20 de Kooning's and I've done 30 Gorky's and and she becomes also the freeze frame. She's walking. When you see them all lined up, you see her walking in the room. She's walking across. And so she is the moving factor, almost like in a film. For the abstract paintings, the, the working with form and color is continuously moving on each painting. So therefore, it's like a movie all the time. All the time. That's Thanks. why I have so many rocks. I mean, rock here. Rock here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know uh, next to nothing about art, but I've always been interested in abstract or expressionist art. Mm -hmm. So I've always been interested in the process. So without going too much into it, when you begin a painting, do you see, for, for abstract and expression specifically, do you see the whole thing before you begin? Yes. Or you do? Okay, it's, so you, it's not like a putting bits and pieces together? Well, it is putting bits and pieces together, but I already have it in my mind. I have an idea in my mind of what I think it's going to look like, because that's not, I can't know what it's going to look like. But I'm working very spontaneously, as Mr. Kandinsky called it, improvisational, I mean improvisations. Or if I want to call it just these forms that are running all over the place. And I am thinking, because I think a lot, I am thinking about the relationships between all the forms. So if it were a figurative painting, I would still think about the relationships between the forms. But if I don't have a figure in there, then I'm thinking of an orange blob and a yellow blob, and I'm, and then I need some blue, and then I need some green. But I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about how to balance my forms in my painting, and I'm always thinking about the edges, and I'm always thinking about the movement, and I'm, I'm constructing what I had, the forms that came from a deconstruction. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Very nice. Um, I was wondering two things. One, why is it always a girl looking at the paintings? And two... Wait, I, why is it always what? A girl who's walking through your paintings okay. looking at the other people. Mm -hmm. And the other one, is that kind of like you looking at the world of art? It's me. Okay. <laughs> it's Marsha. It's La Marchina. Vero? <laughs> it's my nickname, Marchina. I wanted to ask about another uh, master, because when you have the, the pieces of the people ascending in the white background, mm -hmm. made me think of Clifford Still. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, a lot. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. In fact, when I painted them, I liked to try and do what he does, because he makes a brushstroke going this way, and then he makes a brushstroke going this way, and they meet, and you don't know which one came first. And I would have seen his paintings 
many times. And that's what I was thinking about when I was painting it. Thank you. Hello? 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 Hi, Marcia. Uh, Hi! <laughs> um, I just have a quick question for you. Um, um, so there's a lot of information that we're surrounded by every day, and I'm wondering um, what your methods are for distilling that information and picking and choosing um, things that are specific and important to you. Excellent question. Okay. <laughs> I have this um, motto, I think I could call it, where I say very often, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and lots of things don't matter. It's my opinion. I can't say this for someone else. Okay. Naturally, I have learned how to consider things that are important to me and that are not. And I also have people in my life that will say to me, Marsha, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so if you trust other people, these important people in my life, and they say, it's over, Marsha, let's move on. I tr and I try my best to do just that. Because I'm not always capable of distilling. I'm not a robot. I have feelings. I'm not always able to do that. But other people can help me. Did I answer your question? Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that, means, that means good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it.